Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the second day of OIS 21. I hope this day finds you well. For those of you that weren't here yesterday, my name is Almudena Azcara de Ortega. I'm a researcher at UNIDA focusing on space security, and I will be your Master of Ceremonies for the day. We have a very exciting panel today, a very exciting day, uh, as a matter of fact. We touched on many key uh, topics yesterday that dealt with the challenges relating to space security. And today we're going to be focusing on the tools and mechanisms that we can use to address those challenges. And without further ado, let me introduce the fantastic panel that we have for today. Most of them are present today. First up, we have Ambassador Aidan Liddell. He is the Ambassador to the United Kingdom Delegation to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Thank you for being here. We also have Ambassador Gustavo Anchil. He is the Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Argentine Rep Republic to the International Organizations in Vienna. And he is also the current um, Hague Code of Conduct Chair. We also have Konstantin Rontsov. He is the Acting Deputy Director uh, for the Department of Non-Proliferation and Arms Control of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. Uh, joining us virtually, we have Jessica West. She is a senior researcher uh, at Project Plowshares in Canada. And we also have joining us virtually uh, Jin Yuan Su, he is a professor of international law at Wuhan University. And the moderator for today is going to be um, Xavier Pasco. He is the director of the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique. Um, our panel today is going to be uh, talking about non-binding norms and transparency and confidence building measures. So with that, I see the floor to uh, Xavier. Good morning, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Xavier Pasco, so I'm the director of the Foundation for Strategic Research, Foundation pour la Recherche Stratégique, based in Paris, a think tank devoted to international uh, relations and security um, issues. And, and the Foundation is, is very happy to uh, support this 2021 uh, Outer Space Security Conference organized by our uh, colleagues uh, from UNIGIR. Uh, in this context, the FRS has uh, also been acting at the EU Implementing Agency for a project on the Hague Code of Conduct against ballistic missile proliferation. And in fact, since 2008, the Foundation has acted in support of this uh, edge code and ballistic missile non-proliferation in the framework of the uh, implementation of the European Union strategy against uh, weapons of mass destruction and proliferation. So uh, we are very happy to be associated with this event. Uh, uh, today, as you mentioned, Mudena, we are particularly, I, I, I will particularly pleased to contribute to this uh, uh, very timely exchanges and discussions at a time when space activities have been transforming uh, more rapidly than ever. It's been mentioned several times yesterday. It's raising a series of issues directly impacting on our collective security environment. Um, the panels of yesterday have, uh, have touched upon several um, uh, possible consequences stemming from those transformations, uh, from the evolution of Paros to uh, new space uh, threats or challenges, uh, themselves related to uh, renewed security and defense perspectives and perceptions, I would say, but also to the evolution of technologies themselves even if it's been recalled also that um, our military space systems remain highly specific in their technology and the technology that they're using and uh, also in, the, in their usage. But still, uh, those changes uh, in technologies as well as, as the ever-increasing uh, uh, number of even more capable objects in the orbit have been inducing uh, new uncertainties. At the very moment when states have never depended so much uh, on their space assets for their defense needs, for their security needs, uh, and more largely for their uh, general economic well-being. Um, so have, after having set the space scene yesterday, our conference today uh, will dig a little bit deeper into the possible ways forward. 
uh, that have been proposed for advancing uh, uh, collective security mechanisms. Um, and this particular panel uh, will discuss the perspectives offered by non-binding measures, um, the resolution 7536, uh, uh, and the ongoing uh, uh, efforts to promote transparency and confidence building measures in space are good example uh, that we will address in more depth by, in, in this panel. Uh, we also uh, examine, as been mentioned already, uh, existing instruments such, such as this AIG code of conduct, not specifically designed or built uh, for the space domain, uh, but with actual relationship with space-centered uh, issues and, and space-related issues, offering possible lessons uh, as, as a living multilateral uh, instrument forum promoting transparency. How can be could help uh, our space discussions? I think this will be the central questions. Uh, so for giving us a much more complete view than this and, and, and on all these issues, uh, I really have the pleasure to welcome all this very, very knowledgeable and thank you for, for your being here. Uh, 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 panelists uh, here on site or online, with, I see Jessica in front of me. Uh, I'm very happy to, to, to moderate this panel. So I will now hand over maybe to Ambassador Little for a first uh, thoughts, I would say. Thank you. First, let me let me say what a pleasure it is to be invited to to speak along such a alongside such a distinguished panel on this uh, on, on this subject. Uh, and thanks very much indeed to to Unidir for organising us. It's uh, it's been too long since we all got together to uh, to, to discuss this. So uh, uh, it's very very good that we've uh, that the, the space security conference is is back up and running after a after a, uh, a slightly strange uh, strange year and a bit. Um, <laughs> So this is obviously a, an extremely important subject, and I, I think I'd like to make sort of two broad points before, before I start getting into the detail. Um, the first point, of course, is that uh, this isn't a binary choice. Um, voluntary or non-binding measures are, are, not, are not in opposition to legally binding uh, measures. Uh, I know we're going to have a discussion on, on the legally binding aspect uh, um, following this, but it's, it's important to say this is not this is not a, an, an all or nothing approach. Um, voluntary, uh, voluntary and legally binding norms uh, uh, can can reinforce each other. And, and uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the, the particular role that uh, non binding norms or voluntary norms have to play. But but it's not a it's not a binary choice between them. Uh, and the second point I, I wanted to make just to, to begin with um, is, is related to that, which is that uh, the UK sponsored resolution on norms, rules and principles of responsible behaviour, uh, 7536 from last year, uh, is also not uh, just about voluntary norms. Um, we do uh, say in the resolution very clearly that, uh, that, that this, this process could uh, lead to, um, lead to uh, future negotiations on, uh, on, 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 on binding instruments as well. So, um, uh, so that's, I, th I think that's an, it's an important sort of uh, baseline to, 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 uh, to, to, to have clear, but, uh, but obviously I will concentrate now mostly on the, on the non-binding uh, non uh, aspects. So there are sort of two broad, uh, as, as the, 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 the theme of this panel makes clear, there are two broad um, categories here, I guess. One is the transparency and confidence building measures, and the other is, is voluntary, uh, voluntary norms. Of course, TCBMs can be voluntary norms as well, but voluntary norms include more than just TCBMs. Um, I think the starting point for a discussion on TCBMs uh, is obviously the 2013 uh, GGE report uh, on transparency and confidence building measures. Uh, there were discussions about this before. It's a, it's a very long and uh, well-established uh, agenda item now uh, in, in the international uh, space uh, diplomacy agenda. Um, but obviously, the, the, the 2013 report is, uh, is a very comprehensive piece of work and I think remains the, uh, the definitive statement, if you like, on, on TCBMs in outer space. And, and that report, uh, I, I think, works on the premise that TCBMs are primarily about information. And there are lots of different ways in which uh, sharing information can build transparency and build confidence, but it is primarily about, about states uh, talking to each other and sharing information about their about their doctrines, and this gives me an opportunity to plug the UK's space security strategy, which was published yesterday. Um, uh, but, but, but there are lots of other uh, ways of doing that as well. Uh, notification uh, uh, of launches, for example, or of maneuvers. Uh, that there, um, there, there are lots of different, uh, different ways of sharing information in a way that builds transparency and confidence. Um, 
so the other the other category is 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 the sort of the, the, the broader um, way of looking at uh, of, of, of looking at non-binding norms. And as I say, TCBMs might be a subcategory of that, but 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 I think the uh, I, th I think there's a much broader um, uh, way of looking at this. And I think this is where Resolution 7536 uh, does provide a, a new approach or a new uh, perspective on some of these issues that goes beyond TCBMs. Um, I'll, I'll expand on, on this a little bit, uh, perhaps in discussion rather than dwelling on it too much now, but, but you, you can look at non-binding norms, I think, and their value in two different ways. One is perhaps as a stepping stone or as, a, as an approach to building, uh, building legally binding uh, instruments or building negotiations that might become legally binding instruments. Um, that can work in lots of different ways, which we can, which we can discuss later, but, but either in terms of uh, crystallizing state practice or collective uh, state uh, practice, uh, or as a way of, of, of simply building understanding or building uh, a norm from the bottom up, if you like, uh, developing, uh, developing practice, um, which can be codified later. Um, but the second, uh, the second way is, I, I, I suppose, is, is and, and this is perhaps what, what we might talk a bit more about uh, in a minute, is, is the value of, 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 of non-legally binding norms, the, the value of, 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 of voluntary norms as, as solutions to space security problems in their own right. Um, non-binding norms are, by their, def by their, by their very nature, uh, flexible. Uh, they're organic. They, they, they develop over time. Um, and I think particularly in the space domain, that makes them incredibly uh, valuable uh, instruments. Um, that's partly because, as we know, uh, things are developing very quickly in space, both in terms of the technology, uh, but also in terms of the range of actors and the range of different issues that we're dealing with in, in, in the space domain. Um, Non-binding instruments can obviously develop as state practice develops as well. Um, they're also, of course, uh, a, a particularly good way of looking at uh, dual-use instruments. And there was a good discussion yesterday on, 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 the, on the, the, sort of the dual-use problem uh, in outer space, or if it's a problem in outer space. But there is certainly a, a, an area there where I think voluntary norms, uh, I, I think, perhaps might be more appropriate to dealing with some of the, some of the issues that we've been discussing around, around dual-use. But I think... Their, their, their particular value is that uh, voluntary norms can be, uh, as, as well as tools for monitoring behavior and monitoring um, whether states are, are complying with, with, with the behaviors that they've, they've set out uh, before, but they can be tools of, of, of escalation management, of de-escalation. Uh, they can be conversation starters. Uh, they can be ways of getting into discussion about a, a, about a particular capability or behavior which might be ambiguous, which might lead to miscalculation or misunderstanding. They can be a very good way of, of clarifying intent, which, of course, legally binding instruments are, very, uh, are not particularly good at doing. Uh, and I think particularly if you want to um, divide the space uh, security challenge into a competition phase and a conflict phase, Non-binding instruments can be a very, very powerful way of managing that, co that competition phase to ensure that it doesn't get into the conflict phase, uh, precisely because they, 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 can, they can provide a way into conversations, they can provide a vehicle for having conversations um, so that, uh, so that what, what might, might be a tense situation doesn't escalate and doesn't get out of hand. So, as I say, I, th I think uh, legally binding instruments have their place, absolutely, and as I say, this isn't, a, this isn't a, an either-or, uh, and norms can also uh, provide a way into negotiations on legally binding instruments, but I think they also have a very, uh, a, a very important value in their own right, uh, and I hope that Resolution 7536 and with, uh, with, 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 with all your support, the OEWG that we, uh, that we hope to see convened next year, uh, that, can, that can really uh, deepen our understanding of the role that, that voluntary norms can play. Thank you. So we'll now uh, give the floor to Ambassador Enchil, who is the EDGECO Chair nowadays for the period 2021-2022, so happy to give you the floor, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Xavier. Uh, thanks uh, for organizing the event, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I will produce the usual disclaimer. Everything uh, I will say now does not necessarily represent the views of my government or the views of the constituency of the HCOC. Um, when addressing the, our topic today, the non-binding norms and, and TCBMs in the context of outer space security, I will try to do it not from an academic point of view, 
but from the perspective of a diplomat working uh, in security matters, I would say a practitioner. Because from such perspective is where I think I can perhaps add some, some value um, based on certain experiences or processes I had, including regional processes. I will share uh, some ideas to our discussion, bearing in mind questions that could be made to trigger the debate. And I will walk around four main ideas or points. The first one is that we have some, some elements which are present in any process to build security instruments. Because this is what we are trying to achieve. I mean, many of us believe that there is a need to go further on this. And um, bearing in mind that that is the goal, I will refer to these elements. We can always have a discussion on the content. Uh, we can have the content could be procedural obligations or substantive behaviors to be achieved. We can have a discussion on the level of the obligation, legally binding, non legally binding, politically binding. But the two essential components for any deal in security matters is the engagement of key or relevant actors in order to have a meaningful tool. When I'm, I say relevant actors, means those possessing relevant technologies in the matter. And this is an area which is expanding as we speak because many countries, uh, more countries are uh, having access to more technologies all the time. So this is a, a changing uh, crew, so to say. And the other element is to have some essential understandings among those actors, some initial points from where uh, you can build. It means that the parties in the conversation should see value in the process from the point of view of their national and collective securities. If there is no added value or if there is a danger, according to their national assessment or collective assessments, then the, the, the progress is much more difficult. Of course, we can have uh, incremental approaches combining, combining confident building measures, non-legally binding instruments. But these two elements that I mentioned, a, a reasonable presence of key actors and some basic understandings to launch the process apply to, to all the cases. The second idea is that trust and confidence are at the center of any exercise in this field. But trust and confidence are goals to be built or reached. They cannot be imposed. There is a point, a very fragile point, in which if you push too much, <laughs> The, the, the atmosphere could be broken. When we consider uh, UN General Resolution 7536 and other very important resolutions uh, of the first committee on outer space, by the way, Argentina supports all of them, we see that most of them were voted, sometimes even in several parts, in, in, in initial points. The recorded vote is the option when consensus cannot be achieved. It provides a photograph, a picture of where everybody stands, where the majorities are. But everybody in this business knows that those voting in many times is unavoidable. If we really seek any kind of sustainable security deal among key actors, we should go beyond. We should go beyond the, what, the resolutions we have. The, the third point is that HCOC, the Code of Conduct, is a good example because of the way it was negotiated the appropriate atmosphere, because of the basic understandings achieved, because of the good balance among relevant actors. Not everybody's there, but we have a sufficient mass of actors from different angles. It has a reasonable degree of flexibility, and at the same time, is quite precise about some procedures. If HCOC could be the tool to be used in the context of outer space security, it depends. If we meet the, the factors I mentioned before, if we have relevant actors, the understandings, and diplomatic negotiations. I underline diplomatic, which means very silent negotiations, noiseless negotiations, creating some atmosphere to, to, to go in that direction. And of course, if we reach such an understanding among key actors and we engage in negotiations, Sometimes the tool we are going to use, legally binding, non-binding, is not that serious. Because if we have a clear political understanding, 
you can stay in non legally binding norms or, 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 or other kind of um, instruments. In any case, and I, in this comment I have some bias due to my position, it should be advisable to prevent such discussions to deteriorate or distort the atmosphere of cooperation inside HCOC, affecting the efficiency of the work in the areas which are covered uh, with the current mandate. We have a mandate and we are doing pretty fine. We can do better. We should, I mean, my, my impression is that we should not bring issues that could complicate that. Maybe we should find a, a separate umbrella or something if we are going to work in that way. And for that, as we said, we need uh, the will of everybody. Uh, the fourth point is that ex experience and, 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 and real politic in the construction of meaningful security instruments shows that the logic of understanding among relevant key actors prevails over the, over the logic of numbers, votes, counting heads. Voted outcomes are useful. They show the evolution of thinking of many states. They are legit legitimate tool to show where we have differences. They are good to set processes to collect information, to provide options, a tool set of options for the future. Or even to promote the visibility of the issues in the public opinion. But the final outcome of the final impact of voted outcomes in the global security field is yet to be proved. It depends, and in most of the cases, it doesn't work like that. Uh, we have some recent cases of treaties, very important treaties that were pushed by the votes. I will not mention them because it should be the subject of another conversation, uh, with a very unclear future, because some of these uh, uh, components were not, were not met. In, in, in any case, uh, the simplistic uh, picture for the media of good guys, bad guys, uh, is not conducive uh, to real negotiations in security matters. Uh, and, and finally, of course, the, the, pan the pandemic is having a heavy impact on what we do. You cannot do many of the things with a screen. You have to, to be able to meet the person, to develop a, a mutual understanding, and only based on that. So we hope that with the evolution of the pandemic around the world, we can go back to track and, and have some real conversations on these matters. Thank you very much. I will now uh, give the floor to uh, our colleague, Jessica West. Jessica, you have the floor. Good morning. I just wanted to say how good it is to see this room again, even if I'm not actually there. It's uh, lifting my spirits, as Ambassador uh, Little was saying. And uh, for opening comments, I really wish I could just say ditto to Ambassador Little. I, I echo his thoughts entirely, um, but that's cheating. So I will instead elaborate a little bit on um, why I, as someone who's working um, in an arms control organization and is very much focused on um, on Peros and, and the control of weapons, uh, I'm a fan of the process that the UK has initiated and, um, and doing a lot of work on norms. And I think there's, I am going to speak to norms now and we'll speak, I think, to TCBMs more later um, because norms are broader. And I think there's two key elements uh, that drive my interest. One is behaviors, a focus on, on our practices in space and regarding space. And the second is our core values and principles. Um, so why are these important for an arms control perspective specifically? Um, as we've discussed, many behavioral rules and practices uh, can also serve as transparency and confidence building measures. And these are a key tool of arms control. Uh, they help build trust. Uh, they can help lead to legally binding measures, but also the implementation of those measures and in fact, most arms control agreements have these kinds of practices built into them directly. Um, and of course, uh, TCBMs have been a priority of the UN First Committee, I think since the 1990s. Uh, I did a quick timeline and it's been a while. And so it's time that we move on this. Um, a key misconception is that arms control has to be about hardware and restricting capabilities and that the kinds and numbers of weapons that we have, but behavior is also core to arms control. Um, not always what you have, but how you use what you have. Or as David put it yesterday, uh, David Coppola, focusing on verbs and not just nouns. And I think most arms control agreements do both of these. And so it's valuable to start thinking about the behaviors that we want to address in space. Um, how does behavior help with arms control? 
I think rules of behavior are key to preventing conflict escalation and resorting to the use of weapons. Um, so that is something that the UK has really been focused on in this process. Um, but behavioral rules can also include restraints and restrictions on the uses of weapons and the targets of weapons. I think test bans are a good example. Uh, so this isn't necessarily new ground that we're covering in arms control. And because behaviors and practices can be easier to observe, they're often relational. Um, this means that they can be helpful as a means of differentiating dual use activities and capabilities and providing reassurance to other actors. Um, but I do have a few caveats that I think are worth addressing. You know, the first is coming back to this overall focus and, and really driver of norms, which is our values and principles. Um, these, these make up the backbone of the shared expectations part of norms. And I think to move forward on this process and, and a, a key objective of the working group should be um, to become very clear about what these are. Uh, we need to be clear about what we're trying to achieve uh, when it comes to Paros. Um, yesterday's discussion was really fascinating and uh, Ben Silverstein was suggesting that, you know, maybe Paros is outdated and what are our objectives um, going forward on space security? I don't think Paros is outdated at all, but I do think that we need to identify what it means today and what the objective is when it comes to norms, um, because it, it, it seems simple on the surface, but it's not always clear. Is it to uphold peaceful uses and restrict the use of weapons? Is it to prevent an arms race or to make it safer? Is it to ban, mitigate, or regulate warfighting activities? Is it to prevent conflict or mitigate its effects? Um, some of these goals are compatible with each other and some might not be. And I know that many people in the room are very clear about their objectives on, the, on, on this process, but it's not, it's not always clear to me that everyone shares the same goals. And I think uh, Victoria mentioned yesterday that we won't get anywhere if we don't agree on the problems that we need to address. Uh, but we also won't get anywhere if we don't agree on, on that final destination. And um, I think one risk is um, possibly focusing a lot on the trees and missing the bigger picture, missing the forest, um, because it's possible to develop a lot of rules and acceptable behaviors um, at an individual level that still can have negative consequences on the broader collective security in space. And I think you know, weapons testing might be an example of that. Um, the second caveat is on the limits of norms. Um, I don't want to go into that too much because I, I fully agree that this is not an either or choice, norms versus law. Um, but we've seen, I think the important point to make is that we've seen in other places how norms can help lead uh, to more formal arms control. And um, it's important to point out that even if that is the destination and the goal of many, it doesn't negate the value and the necessity of the work that we're doing. Um, most arms control agreements are based on existing norms and the uses and non-uses of, of force and of weapons. So I think this is a really good place to start. Um, it's important that we make progress on this and uh, I'm excited to see the leadership that the UK is developing. I think we've dumped so many problems on future generations and space is a symbol of the future is really something that we have to get right. Thank you. I will now give the floor to Professor Jinwen Su, Professor of International Law at Wuhan University. Uh, professor Su, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say it's a great honor for me to uh, be invited to this conference. And it's a great honor for me to be one of the panelists along with the um, very distinguished experts in this field. Um, well, for general views on this subject, I would like to make a general comment and then two more specific ones. So first of all, I think um, military activities in, in space, they are a subject to mainly two categories of rules. And I think we have been uh, talking about behavior based, uh, based approach, capacity based approach by but my categorization here is slightly from a, another different angle. So I think, first of all, there are rules which regulate military activities, you know, um, directly, such as Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty, like the Partial Test Ban Treaty, and then there are another category of rules which uh, constrains military activities in outer space indirectly, um, primarily uh, by limiting its exterior effect either 
the effect on um, the activities of other states or the environment. And I think um, the topic today, non-legally binding norms uh, or TCPN rules, they also, you know, they may also fall within either of these two categories. So for, for instance, the no first placement of weapons in space proposal may belong to the first category because um, states uh, unilaterally commit not to place weapons in outer space. And this is a direct um, pledge on uh, military activities in space. Uh, probably the LTS uh, guidelines would fall within the second category uh, because it mainly constrains uh, the external um, effect of activity in space if they are applied to military activities in space. Um, as far as the new uh, responsible behavior initiative is concerned, from, from what I have read from uh, of the, of the uh, Secretary General's report, I think uh, it may need to deal with both categories of the rules. Um, we can see there are concerns over um, um, the space environment, and also there are uh, concerns over security issues directly. So this is my uh, first um, broad, very broad ge general uh, observation. And second of all, I would like to um, make some remarks on uh, on uh, um, non-legally binding norms. I think few people would uh, dispute that uh, they are definitely conducive to space security, as our colleagues said earlier. You know, they are important, and it's not an either-or issue. Uh, they they may be mutually reinforcing. Uh, but I think the ultimate goal uh, for us is to uh, conclude uh, legally binding rules, either by concluding um, treaties or by accumulating uh, state practice, which would give rise to new customary international law. Um, because they are not legally binding, so they are complementary or transitional. Or transitional. And I think those non-legally binding norms, which um, constrain military activities in space um, from its exterior uh, effect, they are even so, they are even so, uh, because, you know, they are not going to fundamentally address or, or solve the problem of security. Uh, so uh, the, the second point that I would like to make is that, you know, we should ultimately try to um, conclude international treaties on, uh, on uh, the military use of outer space. And third of all, um, I, I think the issue of space security should be addressed within the broader context of international peace and security rather than uh, in an isolated manner. Um, space security is not only does not only involve anti-satellite weapons or, or interference or uh, RPO or, or, or space debris. Um, those issues which concerns the security of space assets, but also more generally, um, because it constitutes a segment or within the broader context of international space security. So uh, anti-satellite, anti-ballistic missile defense may be related to um, space weaponization and even, and even passive military use of outer space. These are all very relevant to uh, not only space security, but also international peace and security in general. So I think um, the issue of space security should be addressed within the very broad context of international space, space uh, international uh, peace and security. Um, so these are my uh, opening re um, remarks or, or, or general views on the subject. And I look forward to more detailed discussion on uh, various sub questions in this panel. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Professor, for this uh, categorization, and it will help, uh, of course, structure our debate also and the discussion uh, later on. We'll now give the floor to Konstantin Boronsov from the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mr. Boronsov, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Pesco. Uh, good morning, colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to welcome all participants of the UNIDIR Outer Space Security Conference, and I would like uh, to express gratitude to the organizers of uh, this event for their efforts to hold it in person after a pause in 2020 
uh, and uh, to hold it in person despite all the difficulties related to the coronavirus pandemic. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a vision on the role and importance of transparency and confidence building uh, measures as well as other non-binding norms uh, with respect to the prevention of an arms race in outer space and the security uh, of outer space activities. So, um, first of all, uh, as, a basic, uh, as a basic thesis, I'd like to say that we need to understand and to determine the role of TCBMs uh, in the context of Paris, taking into account the current situation in uh, outer space sphere and uh, in general in the sphere of international peace and security. And recently, the risks of space transforming into a springboard for aggression and war have become very real. And the reason is that uh, several states are pursuing a policy of placing weapons in space and increasing their force potential, both kinetic and non-kinetic, against outer space objects and using outer space for combat operations. Against these big ground initiatives on Paris and the preservation of space for peaceful purposes are becoming increasingly relevant. And in this context, the development of a multilateral legally binding instrument on Paris seems to be the best option. To this end, in 2008, uh, the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China submitted for consideration by the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva the draft treaty on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space, the threat to use of force against outer space objects, and its updated version in 2014, taking into account uh, the comments and suggestions made by several states. But I will not go into details about uh, the PPWT as uh, this uh, draft treaty will be discussed in some depth within the next panel, panel five. So uh, taking into account this situation in outer space, uh, um, I have a common understanding of the importance of transparency and confidence building measures in outer space as an integral element of such an internationally um, legally binding instrument on Paris. And uh, I'd like to say uh, and stress uh, what uh, Ambassador Lidl said, that uh, legally binding uh, norms and uh, non-binding uh, norms and TCBMs are not, um, are not uh, mutually excluded. And uh, these uh, kind of norms could, uh, could uh, supplement each other, could uh, support each other. So uh, it is these measures that are designed, uh, among other things, to ensure the resolution of disputes related to the implementation of a possible future Paris Treaty. So we also consider TCBMs as an intermediate step to make in the period before the development of the mentioned legally binding instrument, this strategic situation in outer space uh, predictable. Their goal is to prevent space from becoming an arena of armed confrontation, to provide security conditions for space activities, and to protect the property of states. Uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, TCBMs should be complementary uh, to the effective legally binding regime in space activities, but not to be a substitute of this regime. And uh, this is not just uh, my personal point. This, this understanding was enshrined in the 2013 final report of the UN Group of Governmental Experts on TCBMs. So TCBMs should aim for an absolute ban of the placement of weapons in outer space and the use or threat of force uh, against outer space objects. Obviously, it is extremely difficult to address issues related to the security of space activities without uh, slit guarantees of non-weaponization of outer space non-use of force or threat of force against or with outer space objects. In this context, one of the key TCBMs is the initiative 
or political commitment on no first placement of weapons in outer space that Professor Su mentioned in his statement. And it already enjoys the full-fledged participation of 30 states. The NFP concept is supported or shared by the vast majority of UN member states, and this is evidenced by the results of voting on uh, our uh, resolution of the same name at the UNGA sessions. For instance, the NFP resolution was approved at the last 75th session of the UN General Assembly with 132 votes for uh, this initiative. We also intend to submit the draft NFP resolution uh, to the UNGA at its 76th session, and we hope that it will be supported by the vast majority of the UN member states. Uh, we are aware of the criticism leveled against the NFP by uh, some Western countries, and however, this is the only effective instrument to preserve outer space free from weapons of any kind at this stage. No alternative has been proposed yet. This initiative is a reliable political leverage preventing the undermining of the strategic stability and the entire international system of arms control agreements. The adoption of the NFP commitment by all states would basically mean the adoption of a global political commitment to uh, not place weapons in outer space, rendering the development of both space strike weapon systems and satellite uh, defense systems redundant. We therefore consider the NFP a step towards uh, concluding an international legally binding instrument containing safeguards against the placement of strike weapon systems in orbit around the Earth. Uh, we support the continuation of the work on TCBMs uh, carried out as part of the implementation of the UNGA resolution under the same title, submitted annually by Russia and China since 2005. And in this regard, uh, the United States' refusal to co-sponsor and support these documents since 2018 raises serious questions. I would like to recall that the United States previously not only co-sponsored the resolution, but also cooperated with Russia and China to promote TCBMs in the Disarmament Commission. And we plan to submit the draft resolution on TCBMs to the UNGA at its uh, 76th session for its consideration. We hope that it will be supported by the majority of the UN member states, as uh, it traditionally is. We attach great importance to introducing TCBMs uh, recommended by the relevant UN group of governmental experts active in 2012 and 2013 to international and national practices. We believe that they should be implemented on a voluntary basis in national practices to the greatest extent possible and practicable and in line with the interests of the UN member states. Russia, in its turn, has uh, already implemented uh, or is implementing the measures recommended by the GGE in its bilateral and multilateral space cooperation to varying degrees. We indicate in our notifications, for example, submitted to the UN Register of Objects Launched into Outer Space through the UN Office uh, for Outer Space Affairs, the specific function of all spacecraft launched by Russia, and we believe that such transparency should become a standard for all states. So I'd like to stop here, and I'd like to uh, then participate in uh, our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vronsov, for these complimentary remarks. We'll now have a, a debate on, on, on those uh, different issues. I, I noted uh, several uh, common uh, issues addressed in, in, in the different presentations, and of course, um, I would say maybe that this, this first uh, uh, key, uh, central uh, discussion we're going to have on the relationship uh, between non-binding and binding, uh, uh, legally binding uh, mechanism. So, uh, Ambassador Lida, you were the first uh, mentioning uh, the, this uh, um, discussion we can have about this, this issue, so maybe we can uh, uh, go ahead on, on this. And, and, and dig a little bit deeper into it. 
and, and then exchange on this. Thanks. Yes. So, so as, as, as I mentioned, I, th I think you know there is certainly a relationship between um, voluntary and, and, and legally binding norms, um, and I think I think <laughs> I think we've all agreed on that so far that that, 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 that they, they you know that they are um, uh, they, they certainly can sort of reinforce and support each other. Um, I suppose there's, there's there's two there's two ways of looking at this. One actually prefix, uh, pick, picks up on, on on the point that Professor Sue made, which is that um, norms uh, over time become state practice. Obviously, if you if you agree a, a if you agree a, a, a norm either unilaterally or or, or in a in a in, in a collective way. Uh, and you abide by it, and, and you and you act in that way over over a number of years. That becomes your state practice, and more, or co a collective um, expectation of state practice. Uh, and over time, that that can take on the character of customary uh, international law. So there is there is a there is a, a fairly well established uh, route by which um, what begin as perhaps not even stated uh, but, but um, norms uh, of behavior can can over time become become law by virtue of, uh, of 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 the sort of the expectations they create in the way that a state behaves so that's one that's one sort of mechanism the other I suppose is is a slightly more deliberate um, uh, pathway which is that um, particularly I think in an area like the space domain which is so fluid, uh, both in terms of, as I said earlier, the, 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 the technologies, the capabilities, the, 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 the range of actors um, involved, um, that, that norms can become almost like a, um, a sandbox in, 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 in how, you, how you sort of deal with some of the issues that are arising, that you can use norms uh, and, and, the, and, and the, 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 the forums that norms uh, create for discussing these issues as a way of working through the problems that you're right, uh, that, you, that you're coming across, um, and that you collectively you, you, you discuss the problems, you discuss the, the different perspectives on different problems uh, or developments that you see, and that you use norms as a way of, of crystallising the problems, crystallising the threats, crystallising the solutions, um, which over time again can be when, when they when they are understood to be agreed and and are sort of baselined uh you can then codify them and i think this is the this is the thing that we've seen in other in other areas of arms control um for example around biological weapons you know over over decades there was a an understanding that biological weapons were were a class of weapons that should not be used um but it took you know 40 40 50 60 years to to actually understand how that codification of that norm might work. The norm was established, but you still needed a negotiation at the end of that process to then, to then crystallize and codify that norm. And indeed, that, 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 that process is still ongoing. So, so I, think, I think that you, you can see there are sort of two broad mechanisms of how, of how voluntary norms can interact with uh, or, or sort of lead to uh, legally binding instruments. But I think, as, as, as Constantine was saying earlier on, there is also a way in which norms can can reinforce or underpin uh, legally binding mechanisms as well. And there are, as I said earlier, there are areas in which voluntary norms are probably the best solution uh, to some of the problems that we see in outer space. Um, but they can complement legally binding instruments on on on, on areas which which perhaps are best are best dealt with in that way. Um, so long as they're dealt with and so long as they are, are, are built in a way that, that understands the whole picture uh, and, uh, and doesn't, uh, doesn't sort of cut across one or the other, uh, then I think uh, they, can be, they can be mutually reinforcing in that way. And certainly in the case of TCBMs, providing transparency, providing information can be a very, very important way of underpinning uh, the implementation of legally binding instruments as well. Yeah, thank you for, for this precision. Space technology is evolving at a very quick pace and keeps it uh, uh, a very lively domain in terms of how we can approach it and understand even future developments. Uh, Professor Sue, I would like to have your, your view on how to maybe adjust the understanding we have this, this environment, space environment and its evolutions with this uh, diplomatic uh, mechanism that we have to put in place to uh, make sure that we have a, a, a sound collective security system mechanism. How, how can, can this two different dynamics maybe uh, can adjust to each other to, to make sure that it fits in terms of, of, of uh, building uh, enduring legal uh, uh, environments whether they're non-binding or binding, uh, uh, due to the, the, the rapid pace of technology evolutions. 
first of all, I, I, I agree with Ambassador Lido on his observations with regard to, you know, the interaction between uh, non-legally binding rules and legally binding rules. Well, one thing that I would like to add is that, and perhaps this is uh, something, you know, uh, many of the practitioner, practitioners who are in this room are more familiar with. And I think um, the procedures, I mean, domestic procedures to, to be followed, um, to negotiate an international treaty and to negotiate non-legally binding rules are quite different. Um, for instance, if you want to go to negotiate an non-legally binding rules, and in the end, if, if you want to accept that, um, the procedures are very different from treaty conclusion and treaty ratification. So I think they are, they, this is one of the differences and which makes the initiation and the acceptance of um, norms, you know, um, easier for, for, for states, procedurally speaking. Um, second of all, uh, I think the negotiation itself, in itself, is kind of, uh, I mean, the, the, the beginning of negotiation is itself uh, kind of uh, building confidence among states. Um, so during the negotiation, you know, the position of states of delegates, they may evolve. Um, in the end, although the outcome is not legally binding, I think they was, this would contribute to, you know, uh, achieving consensus among states, and this would lay a good basis in the future for concluding um, legally binding uh, treaties on, on space security, for example. Um, another observation that I would like to add is, is, is on state practice, and I, I, I completely agree with the uh, um, ambassador Lido on, you know, the possible forming of customary international law. Um, but I would like also to add that, you know, sometimes, you know, states may be reluctant to, to uh, you know, or they are not simply not able to comply with the norms in the short, um, in the short, uh, I, I mean, in the near future. Uh, and it is often we can see, you know, uh, often we can see in this non-legally binding instrument, they employ such terms as encourage or to the greatest extent feasible. And this would give states a certain degree of discretion in the compliance or in the implementation and gradually. And I think they will, uh, this uh, practice of, of uh, compliance will uh, accumulate it and to a level which may form customary international law. And generally speaking, I mean, for the international community, this is good because for treaties, you know, um, if states do not join in the treaty, they may not um, comply. And for such, soft, I mean, so, uh, non-legally binding norms, um, allowing states to 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 uh, gradually comply with uh, the norms when they build up their capacities, um, it would it would be helpful for the international community to uh, have such an outcome of not, you know, all or nothing. You know, sometimes for treaties, you know, if there's no obligation, there's no obligation. But uh, if we allow states to, to, to comply with that, you know, gradually, um, and, you know, we can see that, you know, states will gradually moving to comply with that. So that's my, my, my observations on that. Thank you, Xavier. Before maybe uh, uh, taking some questions from the audience, maybe a, a last word on the, this notion of transparency, Mr. Pranza, that you've developed and TCBM and maybe Ambassador Enchi also. Uh, how do you see this uh, TCBM notion, the notions of TCBM becoming really central in this space uh, uh, discussions uh, mechanisms? Thank you, Mr. Pasco. Yes, it is a quite uh, important uh, issue, uh, the role of TCBMs uh, as it is, as a notion in conceptual way and manner. So um, I'd like to stress uh, that uh, we uh, should not uh, consider TCBMs in vacuum. So TCBMs uh, should be considered uh, taking into account the context, political context, and uh, also uh, the context if we are talking about uh, outer space uh, security. Um, so um, actually we have uh, the history of uh, dealing with outer space issues and that's why we need to understand what is the purpose of these uh, TCBMs. 
in order to uh, streamline these TCBMs for implementing and achieving this goal. And uh, taking into account, for example, the last uh, proposal made by our British colleagues uh, as the draft resolution on uh, outer space behavior, we need to take into account uh, two things here. I can say, first of all, uh, and as uh, Ms. West said, uh, we need to take into account uh, the whole uh, Paris tasks uh, that uh, definitely are not outdated, and the best proof of this, it is the voting for the, um, the, uh, the similar, uh, the, the UNGA draft, uh, the UNGA resolution with the similar name on Paris that uh, is supported by the vast majority of UN member states. So uh, we need to take into account these uh, Paris tasks and uh, uh, task to launch relevant negotiations in line with the um, 1967 Outer Space Treaty as called for in decisions of the first special session of the UNGA devoted to disarmament of 1978. And uh, we need also to take into account um, uh, the, um, uh, the previous background uh, from actually the middle of 1960s, the discussion in, uh, in the UN auspices and, uh, um, and uh, the different, uh, different results of this discussion, different proposals made by different countries during uh, this discussion. And that's why, uh, from my personal point of view, the comparison with the cyber behavior initiative is not quite correct uh, if we are talking about outer space because uh, there are several uh, decisions made uh, related to the outer space security issues. There are different achievements made by the UN General Assembly and by COPUS as well, and we need to take into account. So uh, it is not, uh, it is not um, the uh, task and the topic that we started from the blank sheet. So uh, we, we had a lot of different de deliverables that we need to take into account. That's why uh, we see that TCBM should help to exclude any possibility of outer space being used to conduct military operations, weapons being placed in outer space, as well as the threat or use of force against or with outer space objects. In my view, it should aim to contribute to the elaboration of an international legally binding instrument on Paris and the preservation of outer space for peaceful purposes as it was tasked in 1978 by uh, the UNGA session devoted to disarmament. And it's still in force and uh, the vast majority of the UN member states support supports this uh, task and would like to contribute to the implementation of this task. And I think that CBN should be devoted to this idea and should be dedicated for implementing this task and objective. Thank you. Maybe Ambassador, I'll share your views on it. Thank you very much. When you deal with, with, with security issues, we are playing with perception of threats. I'm saying perception because it's never objective. It's what you perceive. And this, there is always a, a threat assessment at the national level, at the collective level. When the perception of level is very high, it is impossible to create any atmosphere to engage in any conversation. So TCBMs could be very useful in establishing certain parameters, in relaxing a bit the atmosphere, let's say in stabilizing the situation, trying to create uh, 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 to pave the way to a process where, I mean, Paros is the end of the process, of course, we agree with that. So, so um, TCBMs are not a goal in themselves. It can create to stabilize, to prevent some uh, incidents from happening, of diff diff different grade of seriousness, the incidents, but they are not a goal. But of course, uh, in situations, where there is a, a high level of mistrust, uh, it's almost impossible to, to, to engage in a process without some TCBMs 
to, to create an, an enabling environment for, for, for discussions. But of course, everything depends on the, on the case. Thank you for, for this complimentary view, and, and which really leads me to think that we have uh, um, reached an interesting uh, moment in this discussion where TCBMs are really considered as, uh, whatever our perceptions are, a, a central uh, uh, aspect, uh, keystone of any future uh, reflections. On, uh, on the, on the, on the, um, the goals and, and the, the, the ways forward for, for space security. And it, it leads me to think, by the way, that Jessica, you mentioned uh, uh, that the importance was the, uh, also the, the, the objectives in the end, and that was one of our caveats regarding uh, uh, norms and, and, and discussion. Could you elaborate a bit on this, please, on your side, as seen from a, your position as an observer of these discussions? I think one objective of, of norms is, is TCBMs, and I, I'm going to use norms narrowly. I actually mean behavior and why, why a focus on behavior is so important for transparency and confidence building. And it really gets at the how. How do we build confidence? Um, we know what TCBMs are, but how do we make them effective? And um, behavior is key. Uh, you know, transparency is about conveying information. It's about communication, and this can be done in a number of ways. Often we think of it in terms of, you know, talking to each other. And, um, and I think that's important. Um, but the second part of, of transparency is to demonstrate trustworthiness. And I think this demonstration of trustworthiness is something that we forget about when we talk about behaviors and TCBMs. Um, actions are critical. What we do matters. Uh, words matter. I think Cassandra Steer did a wonderful job yesterday, you know, talking about the destabilizing effects of some of the words that we use to describe space. Um, but words don't quite have the same capability to reassure. And uh, if we want to reassure others, I think uh, there really needs to be emphasis on, on behaviors and actions that demonstrate the truth of our words. And I was thinking about uh, the no first placement resolution, uh, which has been um, at the UNGA for quite a few years now. And, and it does have a lot of support and it also has a lot of detractors. And I've been trying to think about what is the challenge with it? Where, where are the objections? And, you know, a number of states make their objections clear. Um, and I think one challenge is that it's not linked to actions that can be observed by others. Um, so I was trying to think about how it differs from no first use, say in a nuclear context. And that's also a negative security agreement. It's something that is often promoted uh, within the arms control community, um, but it's also hard to trust. And states that do it well take actions that demonstrate their commitment to that principle, uh, such as storing you know, warheads and, and, and launchers separately to signal their intent to adhere to that that principle and that statement and those words. And I think the challenge when we start really broad with no first placement of weapons is it's not always clear to states what to look for um, to, to trust and to have assurance that, you know, this is a commitment that is being adhered to. And I think that's why going back and starting to focus maybe more narrowly and more specifically on very key behaviors and actions that we can do to build confidence and to build trust and to build our own trustworthiness um, is a good is a good way to begin um, and helps us on the road to maintaining space as a, as a peaceful domain, which I fully agree that should be our objective in a way that is trusted by the international community. Um, so I, I did want to make that connection between the what and the how of TCBMs and why a focus on, on practices can really help. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, from Chinese mission, permanent mission here in Geneva, and I'm very happy to join our discussion. But of course, uh, like others, I'm not speaking on behalf of the uh, Chinese mission. Uh, I'm just uh, speaking, uh, very much enjoy the right to speak uh, on behalf of my own. So it's, it's very interesting to join our discussion these days. And uh, I think um, we heard many ideas which have been discussed previously. And also there are some new uh, initiatives have, uh, which has also been uh, mentioned. It's very interesting. And we thank uh, Unity Air and all the 
um, uh, contributors to this uh, seminar and to this conference. It's very useful and helpful, especially when we are in the, uh, such a context uh, of the political context, and also uh, some um, uh, uh, very interesting period of time. Um, like, uh, uh, I, I have uh, two questions. One is for all the panelists. Um, uh, uh, I think um, during our discussion on the uh, new res draft resolution proposed by the Russia, uh, by the uh, uh, Britain, um, there are some uh, discussions about this responsible, this word, uh, how to judge uh, which is responsible and which is not in, uh, responsible. Like previous panelists also mentioned that it is very subjective. And uh, like yesterday during the discussion, we also heard that uh, mentioning the uh, outer space as a warring, war fighting domain is irresponsible. So I want to know how um, the next process, our future process will discuss and will solve, uh, will address this problem and how do you see the difference between that? And uh, like yesterday, we also heard from our high representative uh, mentioning about the Secretary General's report on the, our common agenda. Uh, he also calls for a new global deal to protect global commons, to deliver global public goods and address major uh, risks, and he called for immediate actions to be pursued, including the elaboration of new instruments to prevent weaponization of outer, outer space. So um, there are two words. Of, one is the global common, and the other is the war fighting domain, how to solve this, um, this issue. And the second question would be addressed to our uh, distinguished ambassador of uh, UK. Uh, I don't know how many of us here uh, uh, know the process of the uh, uh, GGE on the Paris, which is authorized by the uh, 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 G8 resolution in 2017, and after that, uh, there w were two years discussion uh, on the legally binding instruments on Paris. Uh, the GGE was com uh, uh, composed of 25 uh, experts from governments, which are from um, America, UK, France, Brazil, India, South Africa, Germany, Canada, Egypt, pa Pakistan, and others. And they have devoted two years to discuss about all the definition and uh, the obligations and the verification and the final call clause, all the substantive issues uh, with two years efforts. But uh, what I heard from my colleagues is that um, actually the GGE was presided by our distinguished ambassador from Brazil, uh, Mr. Pechiata. Uh, he also hosts informal consultations to open to all the uh, uh, member states of the United Nations. But I, I heard very unfortunately, maybe at the last minute, it was blocked only by one expert. So, uh, I mean, uh, how do you see this kind of international effort on all these processes like Paris and the legally binding instruments and the uh, resolution adopted by the General Assembly? And uh, uh, my question to Ambassador Ludo is that, how do you foresee this uh, new initiative of open-ended open working groups will um, take into consideration of these two years' discussions and efforts, and uh, if uh, it will be uh, taken into consideration or not? Uh, thank you very much. I may um, direct the questions towards your Ambassador. Thanks very much. Well, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated question, but I think quite a simple answer, really, which is that it's up to the OEWG. It's not up to me. It's not up to the UK, and it's not up to, um, uh, to anybody drafting a resolution what, uh, what happens next. Um, the OEWG is an inclusive process. It will involve all uh, UN uh, member states, um, uh, and it will have, obviously, a range of perspectives. But I think what we've, what we've been discussing up here is, is the need for a sort of common baseline, and I think the... The, the hope of the, with the OEWG is firstly that it will, um, it will try and establish that baseline, both in terms of the instruments and, and the, the norms that already apply, uh, and I think that, uh, that, that, that came up earlier. 
um, but also actually trying to get a common understanding of the threats that we face. And I think that a lot of the UN processes up, up till now have, have focused just on one issue, which is the issue of, of weapons in space. Uh, it's an issue, sure, but it's not the only issue. So it's not, uh, not to my mind, the most pressing issue uh, that we face in outer space security. Um, so, uh, so it's important to sort of reach a collective understanding uh, of what the threats collectively that we face in space are. And then it's for the OED, OEWG to, to, to try and come up with a, uh, at least a, a direction of, of, of travel. Where do we go from here in trying to, under, in trying to resolve these, uh, these, these, these threats and deal with these threats? That will involve probably a combination of legally binding and voluntary measures. Uh, and indeed voluntary measures that might lead to legally binding measures. So um, how do I foresee the OEWG going? I have no idea uh, because it's up to the OEWG and, uh, and uh, member states collectively. Um, and that really go goes, to the, goes to the first question as well, which is how to judge what's responsible and irresponsible. Again, this is, a, this is going to be about um, collective discussion amongst the members of the OEWG and amongst the international community more generally. But it's also a question of state practice. I think there has been a uh, take, for example, the issue of ASAT testing, direct, kinetic, uh, direct ascent kinetic ASAT testing. Um, this has been something that's been observed now for, uh, well, 10, 15, 20 years, I guess. There has, um, I, th I think without any sort of process around it or any particular deliberate uh, proposals, there has grown a... Uh, a, a body of, of, of opinion about what is responsible and irresponsible uh, behavior when it comes to testing uh, direct ascent kinetic ASAT weapons. Uh, we, I think, all agree that creating lots of debris deliberately is a very bad thing. Uh, and we saw one, uh, one such test uh, in the, uh, the, early, the early part of this century, which created an awful lot of debris, which is still up there and, and, and causing, causing a great deal of problems both to civilian and military operators. So I, I think it's now, it's now accepted that doing these sorts of things that deliberately creates a lot of long-lasting debris is irresponsible. Uh, nobody directed that. Nobody has created a UN resolution that says that, but I think we all kind of accept that now. Uh, and I think that, uh, I, I, I think that really it's, it's what, what is responsible and irresponsible will emerge over time as, 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 a, as, a, as part of a collective approach on, uh, on, 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 uh, on, on state practice. And I, I, think that's, I think that's in some ways even more valuable than trying to sort of, uh, trying to, to sort of um, uh, set benchmarks that may or may not be accepted by everybody. I I want to ask a question about the uh, slightly different uh, side of the uh, uh, transparency and confidence building measures, uh, and namely not, not about the uh, information and data about spacecraft and their mission and uh, uh, maneuvers, uh, but uh, the uh, transparency in uh, terms of uh, access to data about uh, space situational awareness. Uh, we know that the United States does uh, quite a bit of that, releasing uh, orbital elements for a uh, majority of satellites. Uh, but uh, uh, And uh, my take is that it might be useful uh, and valuable if other states uh, that have uh, these uh, space additional awareness uh, assets, uh, they would kind of join this practice in some shape or form, and that might actually uh, be useful uh, in addressing some of the questions about the missions of certain satellites and their function and their danger in, uh, or the problematic uh, nature. So I'd be, uh, I'd be uh, grateful if you uh, panelists could comment on whether they see uh, this as a practical way uh, of, of expanding the transparency uh, 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 field. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this question. And uh, actually, it is related with the question about what is responsible and irresponsible because it uh, could be as a, an instrument, as you, you've mentioned it, uh, uh, to uh, determine whether it is so called responsible or so called irresponsible. Uh, it, it is actually the main problem with uh, the uh, politically binding or non-binding norms and uh, rules uh, that uh, they are non-binding and it is really difficult to ensure that 
this kind of process would be uh, would be fulfilled by uh, the states uh, um, because uh, this process would be organized in a voluntary manner. And uh, you, you, you could not uh, force uh, the state to provide this kind of information. It would be, in any case, on a voluntary manner. And uh, it is uh, actually what uh, the uh, report of the GGE on TCBMs uh, said. There are different measures proposed by, uh, recommended by the uh, governmental experts, and uh, they are mostly about this exchange of different information on outer space activities. But it depends on the, uh, it depends on the will, political will of the state to provide this information. As I said, as for example, for my country, I can say that, uh, and to repeat that, we are trying to provide uh, the information about our outer space activities, to provide it not just in a bilateral manner, but also uh, to the UN uh, specialized agencies. Uh, what about responsible and irresponsible? As I said, uh, I see uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of possibilities to um, politicize this process because it is uh, some kind of subjective notion about responsibility, about what is responsible and irresponsible. And it, it really matters who would decide uh, on the ad hoc basis uh, on the specific situation, whether it is responsible or irresponsible, because I see a lot of opportunities uh, for different interpretations of uh, this or that uh, specific case. So uh, it is actually the issue that uh, I, I think uh, we raised the last year and we need to continue the discussion of this issue because uh, from the uh, legal point of view, the notion of responsibility is quite subjective and I can say it is not quite legal term. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to uh, I'm tempted to come back on the last uh, the last point that Constantine made by saying that precisely because it isn't a legal term is why we need a a, a non-binding or voluntary a voluntarily binding process to, uh, to, to 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 get into these issues. And I think, uh, as I said earlier, non, the part of the value of non-binding or voluntary norms can be to start conversations. And it's precisely so that when we observe behaviour, we can say, well is this responsible or irresponsible and trying to understand the intent behind it I think is actually part of the confidence building uh, nature of it but also it can lead to, to, to things that can be more precise in, in the future so I, I, th I think that's uh, I think it's an important point but I actually, I actually wanted to come back on, on Pavel's point about um, ab about uh, space situational awareness because I think I mean it's, it's particularly important when we're talking about voluntary uh, voluntary norms or non-binding norms or politically binding norms we, we use all these terms slightly interchangeably but I, I guess they're all they're all slightly different as well um, but it comes back to the point that's been made I think a few times over the last couple of days about uh, about behaviors uh, and about um, focusing on the verbs and not necessarily the nouns and I think this is where space situational awareness can really help because with with the with the tools that we have now we can't necessarily verify the capabilities of objects and all, but we can certainly see what they're doing, uh, and we can we can then we can we can we can very clearly observe the behaviours of objects and and the operators who are uh, who, who are controlling them. Um, so I, I, I think space situational awareness is a really important uh, aspect of, of of all of this, and it can really both help I think specify um, what sort of behaviors we are seeing and therefore lead into those conversations that I was just talking about, about how to characterize them. Uh, but it also goes to the point that, uh, that Jessica, that Dr. West was making earlier about, uh, about demonstrating uh, behavior, about, about demonstrating um, uh, trustworthiness rather than just, rather than just sort of uh, 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 using rhetoric. Um, the last point I'll, I'll just make about the SSA, though, is, is that it's, it's important that there are a range of actors in this. Of course, states, a few states still have the most advanced capabilities when it comes to space domain awareness and space situational awareness. But increasingly, these, these sorts of tools are now available to all. There are some incredibly powerful commercial tools available in SSA um, that, that, that anybody can have, can have access to or, 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 or buy access to. Um, and I think we're increasingly seeing uh, 
uh, much deeper cooperation between states and commercial providers of SSA as well. And part of the part of the uh, the UK strategy that we announced yesterday was indeed to try and deepen that. There's a commercial integration cell which is all about deepening the cooperation between uh, between states and commercial actors. And I think this could this could really be the basis of something quite uh, quite powerful when it comes back to demonstrating trustworthiness and leading to those those conversations that we need to have. I think Professor Su you had a also a, a remark to make. Um, thank you. I would like to respond very briefly to the question um, raised in the conference room regarding the sharing of uh, SSA data, for example. And um, well, I, I I think this is a question which shows, you know, the maybe the, the question of subjectivity of the term responsible. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, for example, you know, to say that you know refuse to share SSA data is an irresponsible behavior in outer space or not. Because states would uh, have a very different perception on that. Well, I'm an international lawyer, so uh, to me, I mean, with all due respect to, to our uh, British colleagues, uh, to me, as an international lawyer, the term responsible or irresponsible is not uh, ideal, because in international law, responsibility is a rather it's a very unique term. Uh, when we talk about responsible or responsibility, uh, usually, usually there's a breach of international obligation. Um, so to me, here is more close to best practice, I think. Um, and second of all, even as a non-legal term, I mean, re responsible or irresponsible, sometimes may not be helpful to 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 the resolution of uh, space security issues. You know, for example, um, if we see uh, an activity in space in isolation, well, it may be seen as irresponsible, but if we see it in a more uh, broader context, it, it, may be, it, may, it may be consistent with the national interest of the country, you know, starting from very early, initially, I mean, space was used for verification of, uh, of uh, arms control treaties for uh, reconnaissance, um, and later then it was uh, used to uh, contribute to ballistic missile defense, to conflicts on the ground and then there's an issue of the development of anti static weapons so each step they are taken as rational by states who do that but you know each of them if they are taken separately they may be seen as irresponsible so i don't i don't I, i'm not quite sure you know whether we, we we pin attack to a behavior as responsible or behavior would be helpful we we need to see that in a broader con context and i think a final remark on uh, I think the the, the 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 question on war fighting domain was not addressed you know by the panelists um, so very briefly I think um, I have no doubt that you know such initiatives you know such as responsible behavior would be helpful but in, at the same time we can see that you know um, there's a growing uh, taboo for example against uh, you know um, some behaviors which, which are uh, detrimental to the space environment, because we can see most states have capacity. They are the most reliant on space. So for example, I can see personally, I think there's a growing taboo against uh, you know, the creation of large amounts of debris in space, but the declaration of space as war fighting domain or operation domain uh, may not, uh, you know, they, they may form as a hurdle to such the forming of such taboo. Um, thank you, Chair, that's my comment. I just wanted to point out the fact that Hitchcock, it's also an information sharing mechanism, by the way. And, and this is very important in the confidence building measure you, you were mentioning, Ambassador, if you want to comment on that. I wanted to say that with all your respect, it doesn't matter which position you take when you discuss words. If it is responsible, responsible, global good, or whatever, how much you label, the, how you label the behavior. What matters is what you agree. We, will, we may never agree on the motives why we do something. The important is that we agree to do something, concrete actions. And though I understand from the polit uh, from political level, our point of view, it's important for some positions to, to defend the position and to use some words. This is not conducive to a result. Hcock is the clear lesson. There is no discussion about so we, we avoid a number of definitions because if we go into the definitions, we cannot move forward. So we go straight to the actions, 
we can agree. And if I may say something about the, the uh, comment that, the, for instance, the U.S. decides to publish certain information. In the context of HCOC, Argentina, for decades, decided to report launches below the threshold of the treaty. Why? Because we understood that in our region, reporting below 300 kilometers was useful, but nobody else followed. And I, I mean, we respect that. But I mean, the point is to match your concern with the concern of the other. It doesn't matter the words with all your respect. Thank you. My name is Andrei Subalin. I'm a counselor of uh, Russian mission uh, here. So just my uh, comment on the Pavel's uh, uh, questions regarding the uh, SSA uh, sharing. Uh, and uh, I would like to remind everyone to the uh, uh, Russian proposal uh, several uh, years ago uh, that uh, we uh, should create an, uh, uh, a platform uh, on the, the aegis of uh, UN to distribute and assess uh, information in outer space activity. It was proposed, if my memory serves me well, in the copious uh, framework. And the problem is that uh, today we see uh, such proposals only related to military activities. And uh, we think that, uh, uh, that United States proposals uh, that uh, uh, draw us into the uh, kind of mechan military mechanism is not uh, suited well uh, our warnings regarding outer space activities and dual use of outer space and uh, peaceful use of outer space. That's why we are uh, keeping our proposal on the table uh, to consider a uh, multilateral UN-based approach toward uh, SSA. Thank you. What would be the prospect of the various initiative, 7536, PPWT and FP to evolve into an integrating concept to address the pressing issue of addressing the challenges in space security. And uh, it's coming from Gerben Asbrook from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Thanks. Well, I, I think, I mean, we, we, we saw in the responses to the UN Secretary General's report under the aegis of 7536 that, that all of these issues were, were, were brought into the conversation. So I think, I think it's clear that the states do see uh, uh, the discussion on, on, on responsible behaviours as being somewhere where we can bring all of these questions up, and I hope that the OEWG will, uh, will, will, will take, that, uh, take that to the next level. Um, you know, behaviours, as I say, can be, is, is, a, is, a, is a very broad term. Uh, it, uh, it involves all sorts of different things. It can, be, uh, it can lead to conversations about legally binding instruments or voluntary measures or... TCBMs uh, and, and other such things. So I, I, th I think, uh, you know, it really is a very broad uh, vehicle. Uh, and it was really encouraging to see so many states uh, engaging in the UN Secretary General's report and bringing indeed all of these issues uh, in, into it as well. So, as I say, the, as I said right at the beginning, uh, and this is perhaps a good place to finish as well, you know, the, 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 the initiative around responsible behaviours was not designed to be a, a, to, to, to place a, bli a binary choice bet before anybody. Uh, it was designed to, uh, to offer a new approach, a new angle to, to discussing these old questions that we've been talking about for a long time. Uh, and what, whatever solutions come out of it, and it will be a combination of solutions, um, uh, and, and it will be a combination of, uh, of different types of solutions, they, they need to add up to something which, which um, not only meets the concerns of all states and provides a common frame of reference for the threat that we face and the, and the solutions to, uh, to dealing with those threats, but it also needs to be a platform for something that can be a, a conversation that goes into the future as well and takes into account developments uh, in, in, in the outer space domain. Um, so uh, we very much look forward to the debate in, in New York over, th over the coming weeks and, uh, uh, and hope that, uh, that the Open Ended Working Group can, can really take these issues forward. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Ancio, maybe for a few words. The submissions in, in, in response to, to the call of Resolution 7536 uh, increase the number of options that we have. It just add more options to the, to the set of tools that we have. Um, and uh, we already had some tools. We may have more. The point is to sit down around the table to start to pick up from the menu of options. And that's a separate process. But in this stage, it's very useful that countries can contribute producing. Maybe somebody has the, the golden key to this. Thank you. I'm very glad to hear that you know, the uh, responsible behavior initiative will be a comprehensive one. Um, 
covering uh, different uh, you know concerns over uh, the security issues uh, as reflected in the Secretary General's uh, report. And I hope that you know these issues, this concern will be addressed adequately and then on an equal basis. And I think at the same time there will be big challenge because you know some of these issues are you know simply in stagnancy, like like for instance in a CD. But uh, nevertheless, I mean it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something we need to work on. Thank you. I'm not sure that the goal will be to have a single integrated solution really to all of our our um, challenges in outer space when it comes to security. I, I think we need the the full menu, <laughs> if you will. And really, our objective should be to start developing more tools to get us there, as long as different initiatives are all pulling in the same direction, which is, I think, prevention of an arms race and prevention of, of conflict in outer space. Um, I'm more a fan of thinking about the, the way forward in terms of a process. And I love the line that I borrowed from, from Martha Finnemore. And I'm sorry, I'm not a lawyer. I, I come from social science. And so um, I think differently. But she says, you know, that. The process is the product, and I think thinking in those terms is very helpful. What do we need to make the process work? Um, and I think in space in particular, we're missing still a lot of the diplomatic tools that would help us with transparency and confidence going forward, that would help us uh, practice good behavior, observe good behavior, share information. Um, and I, I think that missing middle of mechanisms between what we do operationally in space and what our broader um, goals and objectives are when it comes to collective security is something that um, I'm hoping we can address and, and also talk about at the open ended working group. Um, how do we get from paper uh, to actions and practice in an improved security environment in space? Yes, we have. Uh like menu à la carte uh, with different uh, TCBMs already that already exist uh, as for example uh, the Russian initiative on NFP or other different initiatives dedicated to the civil outer space activities uh, elaborated at the Copius uh, venue like LTS uh, or initiative for example so but uh, as I said uh, it is a really important thing that these initiatives would be dedicated to the tasks, objectives, and goals elaborated and adopted by the international community. And uh, if we are talking about military perspective, it is the goal of Paris and the negotiations on the legally binding instrument and the international community is waiting for this legally binding instrument in order to prevent an arms race in outer space, to prevent the weaponization of uh, the outer space, uh, and to prevent uh, the use of force or threat of force um, uh, against outer space objects or with uh, their use. So uh, it is actually the main idea and the most important thing, uh, as I said before, it is that these TCBMs would not substitute the legally binding perspective and would not substitute the main goal of uh, elaboration of the elaboration of this legally binding instrument on Paris with the safeguards to prevent weaponization of outer space and use of force in outer space or against outer space. Thank you. Thank you very much for these last words, and I would like to congratulate very warmly our panelists for this very very exciting and. Fascinating discussions. I, I feel like we have a, a, a great uh, uh, panel here for advancing and, and, and going forward for, for our discussion.